I want to talk at least briefly about MR spectroscopy. which is something we often don't end up having time to include in the course, but I want to at least give you a sense of what it is that we're doing when we do MRS. So the basics we've actually already talked about when we discussed chemical shift. We said that if we turn on our RF to generate some signal, and then at some point TE we sample that signal, So at this point we acquire multiple samples of the signal. If we do this with no gradient magnetic field at all present and we feed this information into the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform will give us a list of frequencies with matching signal intensities. And we can actually just make a graph of frequency versus signal intensity and it will look like that. What it is telling us is the different frequency components that are in our MR si signal with no spatial information whatsoever. So we know that there are different frequencies of precession because of different chemical environments that cause the spins to precess at different frequencies. But it's important to realize that when we do this there is absolutely no spatial information whatsoever. This signal would come from the entire patient. If I used a slice select gradient, well, that would allow me to select this signal from a slice, in which case I could tell you that this frequency spectrum was derived from everything in a single slice of the patient. That's a little bit better than having no idea where it comes from. But in terms of, you know, diagnostic utility, it doesn't really help. We want to be able to compare, let's say, the brain tumor to some normal part of the brain or, you know, one side of the prostate to the other, whatever it happens to be. So how is it that we can get localized information? We can't use the phase and frequency encoding that we typically are employing. Why? Because if we turn on a frequency encoding gradient over here, that means that the spins precess at different frequencies based not just on their chemical shift, but based on their chemical shift plus the gradient magnetic field. So the, the first point, the key point that you have to be aware of when we talk about MRS is that there cannot be any gradient magnetic fields present at the time we sample the signal. May not happen. But that's only an issue at the time that we sample the signal. Having the slice select gradient on when we select the slice doesn't really matter. The point is that when we make our samples which ultimately go into the Fourier transform, we need to have frequency differences that are only a function of the chemical shift. So as many of you may be aware, when we do an MR spectroscopy exam, right, at least in the simplest sense, we do something that we call single voxel spectroscopy. Which means if you've ever seen one of these images, there'll be a little box on the brain and a little <coughs> graph. And what that means is that this spectrum came from this location in the brain. Okay, well, how do you do that? How do you localize the signal in the brain if we can't do any of the typical spatial localization we've talked about? Well, the way we do that is to alter our pulse sequence so that we have a series of RF pulses such as this. And we have our three gradient magnetic fields. I won't call these phase and frequency. I'll just call them gradients. And we do this. 
What does that mean? This means that when we apply our 90 degree RF pulse, we generate signal from an entire slice. When we apply the second 180 degree RF pulse, I'm sorry, the second RF pulse, which is a 180, it's also slice selective, but it is slice selective for a slice that is orthogonal to the first slice. What that means is that the only spins which see this 180 degree RF pulse are the ones along a column of tissue in the slice that we just selected. Right. So the spins at the intersection of these two slice selections are refocused right, and they see that 180 degree pulse and generate a spin echo at some point later on. So if we actually do it this way, let's do it one step at a time. If this was all we did and then we put TE over here and we had our multiple samples of the signal, we would be able to say that this signal came not only from a slice but came from some strip of that slice. Is that clear why that is? Yes, no? Okay, if we make it a little bit more complicated by adding this third 180 degree RF pulse, that was wrong. Now, when we sample our signal at TE, right, this third RF was applied in the third plane, which intersects with the column of tissue perpendicularly. So there's now only a cube or a prism of tissue which has seen all three of these RF pulses. So we essentially have a multi-spin echo technique where only the spins within this one little prism of tissue are fully refocused at TE. The others have lost their signal with T2 star. So the signal that we sample at this point in time we can now say comes from a specific location in the brain. Is that clear? Right. This approach is called point resolved spectroscopy or PRESS. So if you ever see this abbreviation PRESS when you look at MRS, that's what it's referring to. So this allows us to look at a specific location. Right? That allows us to look at signal at a proton spectrum or whatever spectrum from a specific location. So now we're already making some progress. We can now do this multiple times, placing the voxel, which is the intersection of those three RF pulses at different locations in the brain, and make some comparisons between those locations. Now, is it possible for us to actually do a little bit better than this? Well, it turns out <coughs> that if we make an additional change here, which is that in addition to this slice select gradient, we turn on, we, we run through this to generate a single proton spectrum. Okay? And what that means is that we now have information coming from a basically a single location in the tissue. Well, if we change this pulse sequence now, so we think about what's happening with our data. This information essentially allows us to say something about only a single point in space. What if 
after we do this once, we iterate it a second time, this time turning on an extra bit of this gradient magnetic field. Let's say between the 90 and the 180. And then the whatever we sample, right, we can place over here. These differ by what? By the fact that there is a phase difference. For every single one of these samples, there is a phase difference between the two of them. Now notice that no gradient magnetic fields are on during the time that we sample the signal. And I can do this again and again with different iteration, with different strengths of this gradient magnetic field. What that means then is that I can independently Fourier transform each of these sets. Each of these is a set of samples. So I can independently Fourier transform each of these sets of samples, which means that that would give me a little proton spectrum for each and every one of these. And I can create that same single voxel spectrum from each and every one of these boxes. And they differ in what way? The amplitude of the signal in that spectrum gets less and less and less as this gradient that I applied gets more and more and more. Okay? Now, if we take each of these spectra and we pick, let's say, the same point in each one, we can do a Fourier transform of those measurements. And that will give us a series of values which tell us, right, those are specific frequencies in the frequency spectrum. They will tell us the amplitude at that point in the frequency spectrum at different locations along this dimension. So we've now been able to divide, let's say this is our, let's say this is the dimension we're talking about. We can tell how much of each spectrum came from each of different locations along that dimension of the voxel. And if we take all of that and iterate it again, turning on an extra application of this third gradient magnetic field, we can then repeat the entire process, repeat this entire process, and then Fourier transform from spectrum to spectrum this way and sort our signal out from left to right. What this allows us to do is to take this area that we've looked at and separate it into a grid right? and from each of those locations in the grid we can devise, we can derive a separate spectrum. Right? So this is called chemical shift imaging or multivoxel spectroscopy. It's a way where we can select a Right? A slab of tissue and we can separately right, iterate this again and again to spatially encode those spectra. And instead of only looking at a single location at a time, we can actually end up looking at, a, in a single acquisition, multiple locations within a volume of tissue. So notice that in this case, of chemical shift imaging, though, it's a specific volume of tissue that we've initially defined. That's based on the three slice select gradients for our three successive RF pulses. Okay. It's the extra applications of some of those gradients that allow us to encode the information so we can separate its locations within that volume. And this is typically, this area is typically called the volume of interest. Okay? So I just want to show you a couple of images and here I'm just trying to give you a sense 
of what MRS is about. So this is a proton spectrum acquired at 3T, which shows you many different resonances, right? In order for us to do this, one thing that you have to realize, which I haven't addressed yet, is that if we would look at the proton spectrum, I showed you something that looked like this, where this was water and this is fat, when we talked about chemical shift. Everything that we're looking at here exists in this region. What you have to realize is that the vast, vast majority of the signal in our image comes from water, not associated with any of these specific chemical shifts, but actually at that water resonance. A key component of the MRS pulse sequence, which we just looked at, where we said, for example, in press, it's 90, 180, 180, is that we precede it by a series of RF pulses tuned to water, which are designed to suppress that water signal. Just like we can do fat suppression, what we have to do is tune an RF pulse very precisely to the water resonance so we can eliminate this large amount of signal. Otherwise, when I showed you this spectrum, you would just have this enormous water peak. We would never be able to see any of this. So a key step in doing MR spectroscopy is first, as we discussed before, having no gradient magnetic fields, right? If that frequency encoding gradient would have been on, we wouldn't have been able to tell the chemical shifts of the molecular populations here because we would have been corrupted by that gradient magnetic field. Similarly, we have to make sure that our B0 is as homogeneous as possible because any variability in the static magnetic field will cause changes in processional frequencies that have nothing to do with the chemical shifts. So shimming and having a very homogeneous magnetic field is the first thing that we have to pay attention to in doing MRS. And the second is water suppression, without which we're never going to see this information. If we're able to remove that water peak, then we can uncover all of these different peaks. These represent chemical shifts and the amount of signal intensity at each of those chemical shifts. This is just to show you an example of two simple proton spectra from normals, one at one and a half tesla and one at three tesla. The first thing I want to point out is that people always want to know what it is they're looking at. In the brain, which is where we generally are applying this, there are three major peaks that you want to be aware of, choline, creatine, and NAA. Right? The way I tell people to remember them is that they read from left to right in alphabetical order. These are the major metabolites. There are others, which we may see especially at higher field strength, but these are the three that are going to be most relevant to what you need to know. What's the salient difference when we go from one and a half to three tesla? Two things. The baseline noise is greater at 1.5T than at 3T. But even more importantly, look for example between choline and creatine and see how we don't even reach the baseline. Whereas we drive all the way down to the baseline at 3T. Why is that? Because the chemical shift increases with field strength. Right? Higher magnetic field strength, that chemical shift is greater and we're able to better separate these peaks. Okay? So here's an example of single voxel MRS. This is a case that Bill Gomes did, where we localize a single location in the brain. And looking at the proton spectrum, if we identify our three major peaks, NAA is always at a chemical shift of two, and choline and creatine occur here in the more or less 3.2 range. 
choline, creatine, and NAA, this is a tumor, right? Normal brain tissue, as we saw before, has lots of NAA, a normal neuronal metabolite, and it has similar abundance of choline and creatine. The signature of the tumor is low NAA because there are no or few neurons in here. These are glial cells which don't express NAA. And the high choline to creatine telling us that there is a lot of membrane formation in this proliferative lesion. So last example, this is chemical shift imaging. Okay. So patient with a frontal lobe tumor where we have a volume of interest in green that allows us to derive multiple spectra from across the brain. So we're looking at one spectra in the lesion on your left and another spectra outside of the lesion on your right. So you can see that this one looks similar to what we just looked at, high choline, low NAA. And here is much higher NAA in the normal brain and similar choline to creatine. The coloring here is an image that is showing you the distribution of NAA across of these volumes. Lower in the tumor in red and higher in the surrounding normal brain. So that's simply looking at the measurement of this NAA peak and putting it on a color scale in the image. So I just wanted to give you a, a sense of what this was about, not that we have time to really go into you know, all of the clinical applications and details, which we could, could maybe do another time. So any questions about this or anything else?